Whether or not you actually admit it, the tight end position is one of the more fascinating roles inside of college football, especially with young quarterbacks. So going into next season, how do you replace the production of a guy like Jalen Weidemeyer? Let's talk about it. You are Locked On Aggies, your daily podcast on the Texas A&M Aggies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, everybody, and welcome back into another episode of Locked On Aggies presented by the Locked On Podcast Network. Cole Thompson back here in the driver's seat talking all things Texas A&M. And today, let's break down how to replace the production of a player such of the capabilities of Jalen Weidemeyer. Thank you so much for joining us your first listen every single day right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube.com, and of course, listen live every single day at LockedOnPodcast.com. This episode of Locked On Aggies is brought to you by NetSuite. NetSuite is the number one source for all things needed today in cloud financial system. Head on over to NetSuite.com slash NCAA for special end-of-the-year financing on the number one financial system in growing businesses found across America. As always, my name is Cole Thompson. I am the host of the show. If you want to give me a follow on Twitter, at Mr. Cole Thompson, name right down there below. I love public feedback. So anything you can do to make this from a quality sounding podcast, Monday through Friday, give me a follow, give me a shout out, and I will add it into the mix. Secondly, Locked on Aggies. Locked on Aggies is your number one source for all things 12th May related content found here on LOP. You can subscribe on iTunes, listen on Spotify, and if you can't do any of that, listen live every single day at LockedOnPodcast.com. Let's start having the conversation of SEC football. Let's go on to that conversation real fast. Because what I find interesting, you know what? I'll save that actually for tomorrow's show. I will. I'll, I'll do that tomorrow. Because I think there's a lot that we can talk about with SEC football, especially with some of these other SEC, game, SEC games going on today. Let's talk about Texas A&M missing on their bowl game. Now, tomorrow was supposed to be the Gator Bowl, which number 17, Wake Forest, and number 25, Texas A&M, were to face off against each other at TII Bank Stadium somewhere in Jacksonville, Florida, and then things got out of control. Right before the start of the holiday season, it was reported that Texas A&M had a massive outbreak with COVID-19, and because of that, they had to bail out of the bowl game with about 11 days notice. It was about 11 days. Maybe it was 12 days. Anyways, what you're seeing is, is that a team like Wake Forest, who absolutely deserves to be playing in a bowl game, and this is not an insult to Texas A&M, they as well deserve to be playing in a bowl game. Eight and four is nothing to be shy about during a tough SEC schedule. But you do look, you had time. You had enough time to be able to find bowl games and find opponents to go up against each other inside of actual bowl play. So a team like Miami is a little bit on that like tier line. Miami, last week, I think it was on Saturday, announced that they would be pulling out of the Sun Bowl because they had too many COVID-19 cases. And Boise State did the same thing with Central Michigan in, I believe it is the Las Vegas Bowl. Don't quote me on that. I know it's Las Vegas Bowl or it's the, no, it was the Barstool Bowl. It was the Barstool Sports Bowl, whatever. Yeah, whatever. Okay. The point of that is Central Michigan got lucky because of their team bailed. And the likes of Washington State got lucky. Because their team bailed. And they bailed, but they were able to still have a bowl game. They just was one less bowl game this year because of COVID-19 cases. And whether or not you agree with the whole COVID-19 protocol and whether or not you agree that, you know, players should be able to play because of, you know, it's an ancient virus that goes, I'm not going to get into that. I'm not. I'm not. If you want to go into a into a political banter, go ahead. This is not the show for you. This, this is not. So you can go ahead and log off. Bye-bye. I'm not going to go into that. That's not my style. What I am going to go into is that Texas A&M right now should be very thankful that they pulled out when they did. Because let's just say they were able to field a team together in some capacity. I, I mean, like, let's just say they were able to get, like, 50 players together. And then players get hurt, and they have to play walk-ons, and then you have to forfeit or something along the lines of that. You don't know what's going to happen. People would not enjoy that game. Nobody would have a good time. Wake Forest would have a terrible time. On top of Wake Forest having a terrible time, a and fans would have a terrible time. Because if you'd be in Jacksonville, Florida, watching an uninspiring a and team kind of trudge their way along to try and finish the season out on a positive note, and that just isn't the case. It just isn't. 
Meanwhile, you look at other bowl games, like the Holiday Bowl with UCLA and NC State and Dave Doran coming out and making very, very, very reasonable, in my personal opinion, comments on how the NCAA failed North Carolina State by not being able to get them a bowl game, reschedule, move the bowl game back, do whatever they could. I'm all for moving the bowl games back as long as it is before the likes of the national championship. I don't really care if we have the Holiday Bowl that was scheduled on December 28th played on December, let's just say, 31st, or January 2nd, or January 4th, or January 8th. As long as the bowl game is not being played on the same day as the national championship, by all means, do it. And if you cannot get through your COVID cases then, I agree with the NCAA. There is absolutely no reason why you should be able to play. Because once the national championship is over, college football season is done. We know who is the best in the land. We know who has come out on top. We know who are the superstars. But a team like Boston College having to pull out of their bowl game, whether or not COVID-19 cases or not, East Carolina should have had an opportunity to find a new opponent, whether it be, you know, two teams playing another bowl game or not. Instead, they're told, yeah, never mind. Not too, you know, too bad, so sad, get over it. And that's not Boston College's fault, just like it's not Texas A&M's fault. But Wake Forest was able to react and act on those moves really quickly to where they were able to solidify bringing in another team. Rutgers, even though they're five and seven, comes into the bowl game and they're there and a game is going to happen. That's a positive in my opinion. That's a major positive in my opinion. Because of what you're doing is you're bringing in a team that is needed at the last second. And you've seen this before. Five, you know, when there's not enough teams that can fill the six and six role, five and seven teams start getting in. You've seen it in the past. It, it happens actually more often than not. There were a bunch of five and seven teams that you could have filled in, or could have called. And yes, it would have been terrible because of they were probably already in off-season mode. But does it really matter? I mean, like, let's be frank. Does it really matter? A bowl game's being played. You get to go to a bowl game. You get to go ahead and have your fan base travel. You get one more opportunity to end the season out on a positive note. And then you would be six and seven. And yes, you still are under 500, but it's a lot closer and it looks a lot better. And you're taking home a trophy. And that's something to be proud of in my personal belief, in my personal standard. That to me is a bigger deal over time. Wake Forest got lucky. A team like North Carolina State, the reason why Dave Doran is so pissed off is because of the NCAA did fail them. The NCAA did say, too bad, so sad, get over it. East Carolina, same thing. Not Boston College's fault, but East Carolina, they got screwed out of a bowl game, and this is one of the better seasons that they've had. The uh, Fenway Bowl. Uh, I'm blanking on who was supposed to play in that one, but that game got canceled. Imagine that that game got canceled. Like, like, that's a big bowl game. Like, that's that's one that was supposed to be prominent during this, like, holiday season, like the mid-level tier. You cost two teams an opportunity. And it was because of one team couldn't get back on track. And I saw this tweet last night, and it was really stupid. You know, oh, you're being really salty about, you know, somebody not having enough players to be able to play. That's not on UCLA. Dude, I'm going to tell you this right now. Dave Doran is not pissed off at UCLA. He's pissed off at the NCAA. The good news for a team like Texas A&M, nobody's going to be pissed at them. You can go ahead and say all you want. Oh, they were scared to go play against Wake Forest. Oh, that offense was too high power. Like, you can do that all freaking day, and that's totally be okay. Because in the reality standpoint is they let the NCAA know in time, we're not going to be able to play in this game. We're good. Nobody's going to be mad at, at uh, Texas A&M for that. People are 100% going to be mad at UCLA for saying, oh, we have COVID cases, but we're going to try and fight it, and then you don't. Or they're going to say, oh, well, you know, this team decided to wait until the last second to pull out. Too bad, so sad, get over it, you're done. People are mad at that. So I actually applaud Texas A&M in that standpoint to be able to pull out beforehand. Uh, yeah, phrasing, whatever. Uh, pull out beforehand before we had you know a major upspike come, say in Jacksonville, and then all these players travel, all these players return home, all these players are you know set to go, be ready to take the field, and then nope, game canceled. Too bad, everyone's out money. Everyone, the school, the fans, the boosters, the bowl game, everyone's out money. I actually applaud Texas A&M for kind of bailing when they did, because if they didn't, that would have been a bigger story, especially because they're an SEC team and a ranked SEC team. That's a much, much, much bigger deal than probably people are actually putting into consideration. This is it. The putt to win the tournament. If you sink at the championship is yours, but on your backswing, your hat kind of falls forward over your eyes. Is this how you're running your business? 
poor visibility because of you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated financial software, well, to see the full picture, you might need to upgrade over to NetSuite. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system in your growth with visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and so much more. NetSuite is everything that you can use to grow all in one place. With NetSuite, you have automatic and your process is in your books. You get to close them on time while staying ahead of the competition. 93% of surveyed businesses are increased their visibility because of they upgrade over to NetSuite. And over 28,000 businesses are already using NetSuite. So for the New Year's resolution, how about you resort to getting a brand new financial system at netsuite.com slash locked, L-O-C-K-E-D. Head on over to netsuite.com slash locked for this special once-in-a-kind financing offering system of the number one financial cloud system in America and its growing businesses today. netsuite.com slash locked, L-O-C-K-E-D, locked. Locked on Aggies, presented by the Locked on Podcast Network. Thank you so much for making us your first listen to your team every day. Now make sure for the rest of the week you listen to the Ultimate College Football Preview Show with analysis from high-end profile names across the industry, those of which who can keep you up to date with draft picks, overall status of players, and so much more. Subscribe to the Ultimate College Football Preview wherever you get your podcast listening systems today. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Losing a name such as Jalen Weidemeyer is a big deal. In fact, it's a major deal because of this is a guy who, in my opinion, was the epitome of what you wanted from that 2019 class. Everyone wants to talk about how that 19 class was just so special. I mean, Jimbo Fisher was the first top five class that Texas A&M had seen uh, since the early days of Kevin Sumlin. It was one of those moments where you look at this roster. Okay, this is going to be our foreground. This is going to be our basis. Several names that are really high profile in it. Kenyon Green, Jalen Weidemeyer. Uh, Baylor Cup, Isaiah Spiller, <coughs> sorry about that, um, Anias Smith, a few other ones that we can throw in that mix, Damani Richardson, a lot of marquee names in this class that have had some bit of an impact, some have had little to no impact, but not the point. Jalen Weidemeyer was probably the biggest surprise of it because Baylor Cup was supposed to be this guy. Baylor Cup was supposed to be the tight end that took over the entire SEC, one of the highest graded tight ends that 24-7 sports had ever seen, one of the highest graded tight ends that Rivals had ever seen, uh, yeah, ESPN had ever seen, Sports Illustrated All-American had ever seen. It was one of those ones where you look at him as a tight end prospect and just go, wow. I mean, wow. Six foot six, moves like a wide receiver, can block really efficiently. And then two leg injuries cost him two seasons. This is really his first main year of being on campus at Texas A&M as a serviceable tight end. And whether or not you think that he is ever going to flourish or not, we can get to that in a little bit. Jalen Weidemeyer was asked to take his place as a three-star talent coming out of Dickinson High School. And ever since, I look at Jalen Weidemeyer and I say to myself, this is what the epitome of good coaching does. Take three-star talent and turn it into five-star potential. That is what Jalen Weidemeyer has done. Throughout his time, he was one of the best receiving threats for both Kellen Mond, Zach Calzada, and Haynes King. He also was a really, really, really well-rounded route runner. He did everything from curls to button hooks to fly patterns to swing routes. He could do a little bit of everything. And I thought that the biggest place where he improved on so many different levels, and this is what's going to get him to the NFL as a very high pick, as a top 40 pick, blocking. He has over 920 snaps of blocking. That is just pure joy if you're an NFL team. Because if there's going to be a lot of NFL offenses that look for getting a flex tight end, there's going to be a lot of them that look for getting a wide tight end, there's going to be a lot of them that look to get a base blocking tight end, and then there's going to be the traditionalist, the guy who can do a little bit of everything, be a red zone target, be a third down efficient player, be that security blanket for a young, t- uh, for a young wide receiver. So much with the tight end position you can look at. But I personally look at the tight end position as an area to where I can see growth, and I want to get the most well-rounded player. Jalen Meyer can live up to that standard, hands down. So the first name that you can absolutely do is just go with what you have on the roster. And I do think that you will see at least a little bit from it. That would be Baylor Cup. Cup again. It's very hard for teams and for scouts and for, you know, for media members and all that to see the upside of a player who hasn't flourished, but they haven't flourished because of injuries. And this is something that could cost uh, Baylor Cup his chance at the NFL. This is something that could cost him a roster spot. This could be something that forces him to transfer. It absolutely could. Is his health. The best ability is your availability. 
And the last two years, you have not been able to see Baylor Cup be healthy. He missed the entire 2019 season with a leg injury, and it was the entire 2020 season with a leg injury. Very similar to what you saw with uh, Luke Matthews this past year, where you had to see another center step up, and it was really a guard and Bryce Foster moving to center. They wait, they had a bird as red shirt because of this guy who was supposed to be your next big time name couldn't stay on the field, couldn't stay healthy, couldn't get out there, couldn't be that guy. But the other part of this story, and this is the main part, it's really hard to give up on them. It's really hard for me and for other people to say, well, let's go ahead and look at what we got. Because when I look at the tight end position, I think there's a lot to like. I really do. I think that Jalen Weidemeyer was just a huge difference maker for this team. But you look right now at Texas A&M as a whole, and you look at what they're doing, they are going to do everything in their power to have a balanced offense next year. And Cup is going to be the main guy, in my personal opinion. He's the guy who, in my opinion, even though he doesn't have play that many snaps, I think it's like 88 or 89 or something like that, still has that upside. Still has that ability to be a really good route runner. Still has that ability and agility to make plays in the open field. Still has that ability to become a well-rounded blocker. And if he can do that at the highest level, well, boom, there you go. That's your replacement. Like, that's it. You just stop right there. We already know he's already been in the system. He understands the offense. He understands the cadence. He understands uh, what we're you know what we're calling an audible. He understands when we're trying to shift up the play. This is what we're looking at. There's a lot to like about a guy like Baylor Cup taking over that role as your team's new number one tight end. There's a lot to like about that. But again, you also have to look at some other players. Probably the next big name would be Eli Stowers. Stowers was a former quarterback turned into a um sorry about that a tight end because of they felt he was much better suited to play the likes of tight end over quarterback if you're gonna go ahead and make him play a new position you better utilize him because the last thing you want to do is watch a guy who was a quarterback coming out of high school transition positions and then transfer and find immediate success somewhere else so whether or not he's a good receiver, a good blocker, just a good phys- physical player, I got to see a little bit of Eli Stowers. I have to. And the reason I have to see a little bit of Eli Stowers is because of when you have all of these other things happening with this team and you see the guys that are coming up, you see the names that are on the roster, why did you go ahead and give a roster spot to this kid if you weren't going to utilize him? And whether that be a quarterback, whether that be a tight end, whether that be a wide receiver, whether that be in safety, whether that be a wide, you know, at, at, at a whole different crop of positions, if you are going to ask him to trade, you know, change positions, I got to see what he can do. Because the last thing I want to do is just have him sit the bench, be like, oh, yeah, we got you. We brought you in because we thought that you were so good. And then he never plays, and then he resents it, and then he leaves, and then he becomes successful somewhere else. So, those are your two main guys that you can look at going into the year as your suitors to go take over as the top names when it comes to replacing Jalen Weidemeyer. There's going to be a few other names, but those are probably going to be your first two. This episode of Locked on Aggies is brought to you by BetOnline.ag. BetOnline.ag has you covered this holiday season with more props, odds, lines than ever before as football continues to march on through the college bowl game season and the professional level of playoffs are on the way. BetOnline.ag is the number one spot for all sports action. Head on over to the website or mobile device using your app and visit BetOnline.ag. Type in Locked On to receive a 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. From basketball, football, NHL, boxing, UFC, and so much more, don't waste any more time. Get on the action with BetOnline.ag, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Where the game starts. Locked on Aggies presented by the Locked on Podcast Network. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single day. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube.com, and of course, the Locked on Podcast Network. Now, let's go ahead and check out some other few names real fast before we go any further. Uh, There's going to be a couple that we can talk about. Max Johnson, former defensive end, transitioned over to the tight end position. I think he's a blocker. I think that's about it. I think that, you know, if you want to utilize him in the red zone, by all means, go for it. Max Wright would do a really nice job at that. But besides that, I don't think that he is going to be able to do that much. Like Smith, he offers something very similar, as in not a blocker, but a pass catcher. If you're going to run a flex tight end, Jay Sternberger, like think Jay Sternberger, Blake Smith would be able to do that. That would be exactly what I would be looking at, is a a Blake Smith, 
Jason Sternberger, you play him in the flex. He does a lot of route running. He does a lot of good things after the catch. That's going to be his bread and butter. He's not going to be an inline blocker. He's not going to be able to make much of an impact on the line of scrimmage. He is going to have to be that guy that's outline blocking, playing like a wide receiver, and is your big flex tight end, Evan Ingram, Jay Sturmberger. That type is what Blake Smith is going to be. Then you also have Fernando Garza, who was supposed to sit out all of 2021 due to an injury uh, that he suffered in high school, but um, he was on the team somehow. Uh, he was a scout team MVP on offense, and his size uh, makes him a really good blocker. It probably makes him a little bit of a kind of mixed player. Glenn Beal, remember that name a couple years ago? He was a you know blocking tight end that had a little bit of value in the red zone. Fernando Garza kind of feels like that type of player. And then there's the two last names that we can probably talk about, and this could be your big breakout stars, in my opinion. Donovan Green, who in my opinion is the more complimentary player. He can do a little bit of everything. I think he's a little bit more of like that flex but he can block. He is a good down blocker. He does a nice job in the run support. He also comes from Dickinson High School, the exact same high school that you saw Jalen Weidemeyer come from. Guy has a very similar build of what Jalen Weidemeyer was. A little bit, a little bit thinner, but you know, get him into the complex, get him in the facility, get him on the workout and weight regiment. He should be able to put on that weight just in time for you know week one of the 2022 season. Maybe he is the Jalen Weidemeyer to what Jake Johnson, the other tight end, is of the Baylor Cup. Now, I'm not here to say that Jake Johnson is not going to be an impact because Jake Johnson on many, many, many recruiting websites was the number one tight end. Physical, good blocker, great inline target, awesome coming off the football, good hands, good stability, great vision in the open field, did a little bit of everything and was really smart after the catch with his body and his body control when it went up for balls that were a little bit too high. All that, did all those things great. But I wonder, do you redshirt him and play Donovan, or do you play both? How do you want to make this work? There's a lot of ways to go with it. But Donovan Green is a really, really interesting player. Jake Johnson is a really, really, really talented player. Both have tremendous upside. In my personal belief, I think you can get about the same amount of success from both, and one of which you should redshirt in some capacity, whether it be you go with Jake and you don't want to play this year with his brother, Max. Uh, you do redshirt Donovan and you play Jake. I don't know. But one of these two, you can absolutely redshirt. And I absolutely think this would be a fabulous move for the long term because of what's going to happen is in a few years, you're going to need that tight end help. Whether Blake Smith transfers, Eli Sowers transfers, Fernando Garza transfers, like all, all, like all that. There's a lot of questions when it comes to that tight end spot. When all these guys are gone, you then have a guy who can be there for another two, three, four years and really, really, really help build that position right back up. But these are two names that were very highly touted coming out of high school. They also have the Swedish kid, a six foot eight target. I'm blanking on his name. It's very, very hard to say. I'm not going to sit in line. Olstrom, as I know, is his last name. Um, there's a lot of talent coming in to this upcoming class. But you look at the names that are there. Baylor Cup right now, Eli Stowers, Max Wright, uh, Blake Smith, Jake Johnson. There's a lot of ways to produce and get the best out of these players. A lot of ways to get the best out of these this position. Jalen Weidemeyer is going to be very, very missed inside of the halls of Kyle Field. But he's not going to be that missed because of there's so much talent at this position. I actually feel comfortable letting him go. And sometimes coaches let you know, we got to get some play moves. We got to get some play from these kids. We got a lot of talent coming in. It benefits us and it benefits you from going to the NFL. Maybe Jimbo Fisher had that hard conversation with Jalen Weidemeyer where he was deciding, teetering on the fence. Do I want to go? Be maybe a second round pick. Do I want to come back? Maybe a top 15 pick. I don't really know. But what I do know is that there's a lot of talent at that position going into 2022 to where the departure of Alexis Jalen Weidemeyer will be missed, but it won't be without warranty. That's going to do it for this edition of Locked on Aggies. Make sure you're following us on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson and at Locked on Aggies. I'll be back tomorrow to break down how to replace the production of Kenyon Green on the offensive line. Lots and lots of options to go there. Lots of different formations you can go with, but finding a way to get his production back that's going to be a big one. That's going to be a very, very, very tall ask. See you tomorrow. And remember, kick him, y'all.